Well, welcome to you all here today, and also welcome to the listeners of VOWR who are with us uh, at a later time. So it's great to have everyone who will be able to hear uh, today's service here at St. David's Presbyterian Church in St. John's. We are starting our time with Living Faith, and that is a statement of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, which is uh, your little green book there, and we are going to be turning to 8.1.1, which is the section on discipleship. And as usual, I'll be reading one line and you'll be reading the next, and we'll hope that our radio listeners can hear the whole. Disciples of Christ are called to obedience. Obedience involves us totally. That his service alone brings true freedom. And expressed in daily living. To the world for which he died. Life in Christ brings joy, liberty, glory. With unbelief, fear, and temptation. We struggle with disheartening difficulties. And gives us power to grow in Christ. Yet our lives can be pleasing to God. Amen. Let's sing together a, a newer song, 379. It's uh, The Servant King, 379. God, the servant king, he 
calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a fragrant offering of worship to the servant King. Prayers of approach, confession, and the assurance of pardon are prayers where we come to God to reconnect with Him, to be uh, transparent and vulnerable before this living God who we trust with our lives. And so as we come and approach him, I encourage you uh, as well as me to come in a spirit of desiring to know this one whom we talk about, to love this one, and to speak freely and openly and honestly with him. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that it is true that you came to this earth, gave up everything, and sacrificed yourself that we might know you. And so we wonder at this truth. The creator of the heavens and the earth, of the whole universe, the galaxies and the stars that we see, planets and suns, and the vast expanse of space all coming from your hand. And yet, it is this very hand that you extend to us this day. It is this very hand that you place around us to show your deep and abiding love. Thank you for drawing close to us. Help us now to draw close to you. For as we draw closer to you, we again see your character of love, of justice, of caring compassion, of kindness, of truth, and of reality. And so as we come to you, we recognize in our own lives that we fall short of your great character, that we find it even hard to love one another hard to be committed to you, hard to follow through with the things that we say. And so we take a moment to confess our sins to you, any attitude or action or inaction which is against your will and way, we confess them quietly to the Lord. not cared for things that are close to your heart, Lord, in love and truth, in speaking to you often, in reading your word, we ask your forgiveness, O God, and ask you to help us change our hearts and minds. Where we have been unkind, where we have been dishonest, where we have not sought your way or will for the day. Forgive us, O God, and turn us around to your way and will. Teach us what it means to walk with you in our daily schedules, in our daily lives, and remind us as you do this at this moment that our sins are forgiven as we have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God in that relationship. We thank you, Lord, for this grace and this mercy. And we thank you that we can sing together that song which encapsulates the Lord's Prayer, which is on 831 for those who don't know it. Let's sing together.
First, the kingdom of God, 625, our children's hymn for today, 625. I forget. You're close. 
You're close. Anybody else? That's called the neck. That's right. Just like all of us have necks, right? And so what your parents do with you is they give you over to someone who knows better. And that's not me. That's to God. And that's what they're doing when they're having you baptized. And then, although I'm not God, a mass, God is a master musician. And he can put, you, put your life together. And then, this is going to be kind of loud. You know that, right? I'm not sure for the sound people how loud it's going to be on, through the microphone. Are you ready? You got your fingers in your ears? That's good. <laughs> trying to do as parents, and I'm a parent too, although my kids are a little bit bigger. You know, everybody, you all know that I was littler than you at one time, right? Yeah. And that all those people out there was, were littler. The all, yes, thank you. And it, we're, all of us were, were littler than you guys are now at one time. But we want to uh, introduce you to this God that we know who plays wonderful music, better music than any parent can play. And uh, that was Amazing Grace, and that's what we try and bring you to and help you enjoy. And maybe you'll hear more from this someday. That's another story. Let's say a prayer together, shall we? Close our, head, close our eyes and bow our heads. And you say the prayer after me and the adults can too. Dear God, thank you for giving us life. Help us now to trust you with our lives. Help us to know you and to love you so that you can play beautiful music from our lives and give you the glory and we have the enjoyment in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys as you go to your classes. taken from Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 1 through 11 under the heading the potter and the clay the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making some things at the wheel And the vessel that he made of clay (coughs) was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight, 
so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. reading is taken from Philemon. It is a letter of Paul to Philemon. Paul is the writing from prison on behalf of Onesimus, a runaway slave owned by Philemon. Onesimus is in prison with Paul. I, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may promote the knowledge of all the good that is ours in Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been afreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an ambassador, and now a prisoner, also for Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but for your own free will. Perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but for more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me, If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confidence of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Here endeth this reading. Praise be to God. I'd I'd like to um, have the psalm as well, uh, and uh, to do that together. If uh, if you take your your, uh, pew Bible, we'll do Psalm 139, 1 to 6 and 13 to 18. One thirty nine, one to six, and thirteen to eighteen, and we'll say the verses alternatively, responsively. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down are and art acquainted with all my ways. Thou dost beset me behind and before, and layest thy hand upon me. Thou 
verse 13. For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from thee, when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. How precious to me are thy thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Amen. And then turning over to our final reading uh, from Luke 14. And the subject of the sermon, uh, although all the passages have something to do with commitment, even the, the, uh, the full book of uh, Philemon having to do with the commitment of, of uh, Paul to his, uh, his friend Onesimus. But certainly our commitment to the Lord is what's at hand in Luke 14, 25 to 33. Now great multitudes accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build what was not able to finish. Or what king going to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks terms of peace. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we do need you to teach us again what it means to be committed to you, what it means to know you and love you, what it means to be cared for by you. Help us, Lord, in all that we do to know anew your presence, your love, and your care through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we transition to the fall and all the wonderful activities available to us, I'm here today to encourage you to budget wisely. Now, whether you've been a part of this congregation for a long time or whether you are new or whether you are listening to this service on the radio, you each have a responsibility before God to budget your life spiritually. Now, most of us know what it means to budget our money. And whether you're very good at budgeting or not, there is only so much money and sooner or later it runs out. Even when you have overdrafts and lines of credit and credit cards and mortgages and loans of all kinds, nevertheless, there's a point where you must choose something and not have something else. Similarly, most of us have budgeted our time as well. We only have so much time, don't we? Whether we have given a priority to our jobs or our school schedules or our recreation or our TV watching or our MP3 or our volunteer work or whatever it is, We only have so much time. And so whether we do it consciously or unconsciously, each of us have budgeted our time and our money. It's quite easy to chart. Just take a piece of paper out. Take a weekly schedule that shows your waking hours, say, between 6 a.m. and midnight. I'm sure everyone is up during those times. Look up your financial records, whether checking or saving or credit card statements, and you can pretty well figure out how much you have spent. But spiritual budgeting doesn't seem quite as easy. 
Why? It, it's because it's something to do with the interior life, the part of you that only you know and God knows. It's the devotional part of your life, what you pray, what you read, whether you read scripture, what other kinds of books you read to encourage your spiritual growth, your understanding of your Christianity, and most of all, your relationship to Jesus Christ. That kind of budgeting doesn't perhaps enter our thinking as much as time and money. By the way, time and money will tell you a lot about your spirituality, and you can look at your records in that regard as well, but that's not today's sermon. That's for another time. First of all, let us listen to Jesus and what he says about your spiritual budgeting. He basically tells us that we have only so many chips on the roulette table of life. We only have so many chips, and we must decide how we will place them, or where we will place them. Will it be on his values, his way, his priorities, or on other things? So he challenges us. Don't be a halfway Christian. Don't be a Christian when it suits you or just on Sunday. Don't be someone who starts to build a cabin in the country but never finishes it. I'm sure you've heard stories of that happening here. Jesus actually was telling a story in Luke more like building a skyscraper and those who planned it, all those who figured out how much money was necessary for building it, basically got to the hole in the ground stage and were laying some of the foundational parts, but then that's all the money they had. That's all the time they had. I want to tell a little story about uh, a place in British Columbia, British Columbia called Kimberley. It's a little town. Uh, there was a mine there, and it closed, and most of the jobs left, but it's still a beautiful place to ski. They changed the downtown so that it would be a Bavarian little town, and they painted and redid all the buildings so that they would look like that. They also built, bulldozed a whole city block across the street from where the Presbyterian Church is, and, and that's actually very good for parking. But over ten years... Later, after this was done, I was there and preaching very much as I am with you today. Nothing had happened with that property. Now imagine, the concrete foundations were still there, there were weeds growing up, there was a chain uh, link fence around it, but a whole city block deserted in the middle of a town. That's the picture that Jesus is saying, don't let your Christianity be like that. Don't let it be something that your parents did for you when you were little, but then you never investigated it further. You never invested in it more than that. Uh, as some of you know, uh, I grew up in a, a little Anglican church in Southern California. I was baptized and confirmed there. Many of you grew up somewhere away in some other tr tradition than Presbyterianism. I never understood until my teen years that Christianity was first and foremost a relationship with God and Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. I thought it was just going to church and trying to be good. I was in a, uh, it was in a home Bible study class that some fellow teen music students had invited me to. I think, I, I think it, were young, it was young women that invited me there, as I remember. And they helped me to understand that Christianity is primarily a commitment of yourself to Christ and his ways. They also helped me to understand that we don't naturally go that way. And that each one of us must renounce our rebellion against God and publicly commit ourselves to him. Now this was a revelation to me, and I know we use, often use other words such as sin and repent, and, but it was... It was something that I had never understood. And so I was very grateful to this group that helped me to understand that. So Jesus says, if you're going to build a tower called your Christian life, then make sure you can keep building it to the end of your life. Don't stop. Others might see and ridicule your building project. But it all starts with a public commitment. Making that public commitment to Jesus and including this congregation or your own congregation as you choose to go further with God is a very important step, and we certainly can talk with you 
in detail if you're more interested in doing that or have never done that. Jesus tells us it's like, and this is the second story in Luke 14, it's like we have a personal army. And may I expand a little bit? It's, it's not quite in the text, but think of the army that we have as our little dollars and minutes. And when we come up against the spiritual realities of life, we realize that God also is there with his army and his time beyond our time and his resources. We need to know what his terms are before we begin to fight our life against his. And we're not, when we are not fighting for him, when we are not living for him, uh, we need to be very uh, aware and cautioned at that point. What terms does God propose to us, lest our, his forces devour ours in the end? It's all about calculating the cost of this living relationship with the living God, because your commitment to Christ does cost you, if indeed it is authentic Christianity. If it doesn't cost you anything, then you haven't counted the cost and yielded all the way Jesus is encouraging us to, to yield to him right now. And by the way, what he says about mother and father and family, he says, not only must we have more of a relationship and commitment to, to Jesus than to our parents or our siblings or our family, he says even more of a relationship to, to him than to our very own life. And so he pushes us to the heights of commitment as he's teaching us these stories and calling us, first of all, to be in relationship with him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all the other things will be added to you, is what we sang a little earlier. So the first step is to know you are committed to Christ. If you don't know that, you can't go any further. And you can't really have any assurance of going to heaven. But when you know that, and you know that he's holding you by, your, by grace, then even death itself has been conquered, and you know that you will be with him. The second step is to look over your life, or rather to let him look over your life, and ask, what would he like to do with this life of mine? Have you ever talked to him that way? Have you ever talked to God saying, what would you like to do with this life of mine today? And just say a brief prayer like, Oh God, my life is yours. What would you like to do today? Someone in the past uh, preached a very famous sermon uh, called My Heart, Christ Home. I think it was Dr. Boyce. I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. He used to talk about the analogy of our heart as a house. Have you heard this? Uh, Jesus is knocking at the door of our hearts as it says in Revelation 3.20. He wants to come in and then he wants to explore every part of the house. Just like you might do when you're about to make a, re or a, a major real estate purchase just as we have moving here to Newfoundland. He wants to see your kitchen, your closets, your basement, your bedroom, your bathroom, your office, every part of your house. The parts you don't want him to see the parts that aren't very tidy and very neat, the parts that have old stuff in them that we don't want to deal with, your old files, your new files, the keys to the house. He wants the keys to the house to be able to come in and out freely. He wants into your garage and into your driveway and into your car, the keys to the car. Now you might say, well, he wants an awful lot. But then you remember that you're talking to God. And I suppose step two in every 12-step program is once we've already realized that life is unmanageable, then we turn our lives over to the one who can manage it better than we can ourselves. And then we can talk about what that might look like in terms of church activities. Many of you are wondering what church activities you'll be a part of uh, in this, this new season of fall. Or perhaps, next, is it next week that's fall? Or is it this week? I can't, I'm not sure. I knew it wasn't the Labor Day weekend. But uh, I, there's a few more of you back. But next week, maybe we'll all be back. I'm still learning. I'm still culturally foreign a bit. But I'm learning. Now, when you ask me, uh, how much should I be involved in church? That's kind of a, a leading question. And it's a tough thing to ask a guy who's giving his life to the church. But what I've learned to say over the years is this. If you're involved in Sunday morning worship, 
and one other thing during the week, you're doing well. If you're here every day of the week, you need to cut back. Perhaps you can join the Friday Bible study or the mission group. You've already been invited to that or the Good Companions or some study or group that I'll be leading soon. Perhaps you can join the choir. Consider offering your, your home for a small group. There, there are lots of things on the horizon and the, the possibilities are unlimited as you and I agree together because a church is more than just a Sunday morning thing whether it's at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. It's how you strengthen the relationship you have with Christ and with his family. It's also how well we invite others into this relationship, whether you're at the university or at high school or in your business or in your family or with your friends or neighbors, all of this. Whenever you talk about this part of your life, it costs you something, doesn't it? Time is the minimum commitment. Your personal time of getting to know Jesus better and your corporate time with the church. Now I know and am very aware as I stand up week by week that not everyone has a great relationship with the church. I'm thinking of here in this congregation, but I'm also thinking about everyone who might be listening over the radio. And I'm, and I'm realizing that many in the church have been hurt by the church or have found the church not to be relevant to their needs. And I'll, and I'll stand here again and say, as I have before once or twice, and say, may I stand in on behalf of the church or the church leaders that have hurt you and ask your forgiveness. Perhaps there is someone or some group you need to address to be reconciled with them. Start with forgiveness, and then remember how much Christ loves the church, which he calls his body, his family, his bride. Don't give up. It's so easy to give up on the church. And I'm saying that, and I'm a paid employee of the church. But it's so easy to do that because there are so many good reasons to leave the church. But all of them don't discourage Christ from still calling this place his body, his family, his bride. He desperately loves the church, and we are to desire him more and more. We are his vehicle to love others and as well to care for ourselves. I've been doing this work, uh, pastoral work, for 20 years or more, and it's hard to know what to schedule and where to start. It's hard to know what activities to do and what new things to try and start anew. I'd love, I'll just dream a little with you. Can I do that with you, just a few seconds? I'd love to start something in connection with the university for students. I'd love to start something in connection to the university for international students because the whole world is here at our doorstep. I'd love to start something in connection with other youth in the congregation. I'd love to do home Bible studies most nights of the week. I really enjoy them ever since I was a teenager. I'd love to have more times of prayer and intercession for important decisions because I think many churches, perhaps ours, I don't know us well enough yet, have lost corporate prayer in the church and the urgency of prayer groups seems to be a thing of the past. I'd like to see marriages strengthened and parents encouraged and children excited about coming to church and learning about this one who is the author of life. I'd love to see ministries to single people and seniors and lonely people, poor and wealthy, all ethnicities, all kinds of backgrounds, coming together under the deep love of Christ. Now, in many ways, we're already here. And we've been here since 1775. The question is, how will we be faithful to this generation, this time of the 21st century? Now, as you know, I dream bigger than my schedule and lifetime permits. If you've just heard me and heard all those things, I can do some things. I can tell you what I think. But it will only happen as many of us say yes to a greater vision of what we should be in this place. Many are already giving sacrificially of their time here. Don't hear me wrongly in this regard. Many more of us need to hear today Christ's challenge to completely sell out to him. He can do amazing things with us. He already has. But what are some of the things that you would like to see this church do? Call us. Tell me. Tell the elders. If you're not a part of this congregation, call your own parish. 
Help us together be more than we currently are. Help us together be a place of wonders. And tell us what you think about cooperating with other Christian congregations. Because as you know, this is not the only voice for Christ in this city. We have St. Andrews, our sister congregation, but we also have the Anglicans and the Baptists and the Salvation Army, the Catholics, the United, the Pentecostals, and perhaps there are others that I have not named. All of us together are hearing the call to commit anew this weekend and the next weekend probably in some form or another. And that special service that you're invited to, that's basically the call to me to be faithful in what I'm supposed to do here. Plus a little celebration. The profile of Christianity may have lessened here in Newfoundland since the schools became non-denominational ten years ago. You can debate that with me later. But the need for everyone to look again at our personal time, money, and devotion has never been greater. And let me just close with this thought. Uh, No matter what decisions you come to regarding the church, remember to be thankful. A couple of weeks ago, I made a plea, and I think we agreed together, to lengthen the season of Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm on a little one-man uh, crusade, uh, I guess that's not a good word, uh, a personal mission, to enlarge the season of Thanksgiving. You know, the, the other holidays have been enlarged. And uh, I'm, I'm just trying to increase Thanksgiving from the blueberry harvest to the... Uh, that Monday in October that we celebrate. I'm not sure the exact date right now off the top of my head. Uh, you, you can learn a lot of things in the blueberry harvest. Do you know that? I was listening. I was just listening. It's quite a spiritual experience, actually. I was listening the other day, and uh, there was a, a harvester that we lost track of. And, uh, and basically they said, uh, they've gone on to a better place. And I thought... Well, that's enough of that. Uh, That's a little exposition on the, 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 what is it, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Whatever we do, let's do it thankfully for what we can do. I know we we all can't give as much of ourselves as we'd like to. Uh, Many of us, this is a challenge for you to give more. Uh, to think and to pray simply and to review in your minds where you are in this place and to look forward with great expectation what God will do. Let us pray. Lord, we offer these thoughts and reflections with trepidation knowing that you may call us to more than we are comfortable to be called to. And yet at that same time you promise that you will shoulder our burdens with us. You will be our helper and caregiver. You will be kind and loving throughout all of our lives to the very end. Thank you for your arms of love circling around us. We trust you for this new season and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The hymn is, Will You Come and Follow Me If I But Call Your Name? 634, 634. Oh,
contract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Will you let the blinded see if I but call your name? Will you set the prisoners free and never be the same? Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you in me? Will you love the you you hide with me but call your name? Will you quell the and never be the same. Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me? Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow In your company I'll go, where your love and footsteps show, thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me. You may be seated. We come to the time of offering. We give to the Lord tithes and offerings to say thank you for the life that you give us the life together, and the life that we have in Christ. We will now receive our morning offering. If you wanted to turn there, we praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator. In grateful devotion, our tribute we bring. We lay it before you, we kneel and adore you, we bless your holy name. Glad praises.
closing prayers are prayers of thanksgiving and intercession, and I always give a moment of quietness so you too can add your own personal prayers, asking God to intercede for whoever and whatever situations are most pressing in your life. It's only a brief period of time, but so often we don't even take a, br a brief moment, at least I don't. So let's go to prayer with these things in mind. Let us pray. And Lord, we are grateful for all that you have given us in Christ. We are grateful for the relative health that we have even this day to be a part of this service, listening to you and to your word. We are grateful for all that you have given us to this point. Help us, O Lord our God, as we seek to involve you in every part of our lives, in our schedules, in our relationships, in our workplace, in our schools, with our friends and with our neighbors, with our extended families, and wherever our steps might lead. Lord, use us as your hands and your feet that our thanksgiving might be a service and a mercy to all who encounter us. And then those who meet us might ask what's in our lives that is so different and so special and that we might point them to you. Lord, we thank you that you give us many people to encounter day by day. We want to bring some of these before you at this time and quietly bring them to you for your intercession, intervention, and creative care, O oh God, we pray for these quietly.
Amen.